Hello, Zoetra subscribers. Welcome to this lesson on the important topic of beneficial ownership. We'll be understanding beneficial ownership in terms of accounting and instruments, valuable instruments. When we are discussing beneficial ownership, whether it is a mortgage loan or a credit card loan, there are beneficial interests to be had in the account, in the account funds, and income like dividends and interest derived from the valuable instruments that underlie the account. The beneficial owner is the real owner of the account funds or other account assets. The beneficial owner is the individual or entity who has a level of control over or entitlement to the funds or assets in an account. This status enables the individual or entity directly or indirectly to control, manage, or direct the account. Beneficial owner and beneficiary are not necessarily the same individual or entity. So beneficial owner is not to be confused with a beneficiary. An example would be grandma who wants to create a trust for the benefit of her unborn grandchildren. Grandma's the grantor and the beneficiaries are unborn. Or the beneficiary may not have any control or authority over the funds in the account or account assets. What is an account? Account is a generic term Difficult to define, having various meanings, depending somewhat upon the surrounding circumstances and the connection in which it is used. Flexible in meaning can mean valuation, worth, value. It may refer either to past or future indebtedness, or an itemized account, or a detailed statement of the mutual demands in the nature of debt and credit between parties arising out of contracts or some fiduciary relation. An account could be a statement in writing of debts and credits or receipts and payments. An account is a named segment of a ledger where transactions relating to a statement of account are recorded. Accounts consist of two sides. Increases are recorded on one side and decreases on the other side. These entries are often referred to as debit and credit entries. An example of a statement would be this mortgage statement, a statement of indebtedness from one person to another. Just a tip on account statements. Most, if not all, account statements that you receive, whether credit card, mortgage, they are unverified, uh, they're not certified, they're just a, a, a statement. But a verified statement would be indicative of a verified accounting, and a verified accounting assures the financial statements are a true and fair representation of the underlying transaction. If the information contained in a financial statement is not verifiable, there exists no basis for placing trust in the information. Valuable instruments. Title 31, Code of Federal Regulations, Section 362.1b, lists securities, instruments, documents declared valuable. Section 362.1, Declaration of Valuables. It is determined that replacements, in accordance with the procedure established under Section 3 of the Government Losses and Shipment Act, of the articles or things or representatives of value enumerated and referred to in this section would be in the public interest. Accordingly, they are hereby declared to be, quote, unquote, valuables within the meaning of the act. A, money of the United States and foreign countries. Currency included mutilated currency and canceled currency, coins, including uncurrent coins and specie. 
B, securities and other instruments are documents private and public. Abstracts of title, assignments, bills, bonds, certificates of deposit, certificates of indebtedness, checks, drafts, and money orders, coupons, debentures, deeds, equipment, trust certificates, mortgages, notes, stamps, including postage, revenue, license, food order, and public debt, stamped envelopes, and postal cards, stock certificates, trust receipts, voting trust receipts, warehouse receipts, warrants, and other instruments or documents similar to the foregoing and whether complete, incomplete, mutilated, canceled, in definitive form, or represented by interim documents. Now, connected to valuable instruments as well as accounts is a taxation issue. Tax withholding is at the center of dealing with matters of account. Income connected to instruments or an account has a tax associated with it. The tax on income derived from the instruments needs to be paid by someone. For illustration purposes, we'll look at a mortgage. A mortgage or deed of trust is a written agreement, a valuable instrument that secures a note, which is another valuable instrument, and gives a lender an interest in property. Now, a mortgage or deed of trust is a trust agreement. All debt matters are matters of account, and there is an equity situation taking place. The trust account associated with it has a beneficial owner. Only the grantor of the mortgage trust account knows who the beneficial owner is, and only the grantor has the power to appoint a beneficial owner. Any proceeds related to the account go to the beneficial owner. They are controlled by and owned by the beneficial owner. Excerpt from a mortgage instrument. Quote, I promise that A, I lawfully own the property. B, I have the right to mortgage, grant, and convey the property to lender. And C, there are no outstanding claims or charges against the property except those which are public record. In a section called Borrowers Transfer to Lender of Rights in the Property, borrower pledges, I mortgage grant and convey the property to lender. The I is the grantor borrower. The lender is the trustee of the mortgage trust account. The word property, when most people think of a mortgage situation, they're thinking of the real property, first and foremost, or only. But in addition to the real property, there is paper property, commercial paper property, such as the mortgage and the note. So at closing, at a purchase, a real estate closing, only the grantor borrower executes the note and mortgage. But after closing, an interesting thing occurs regarding the note. The note is endorsed by the lender, by an accommodation endorser. <clears throat> Sometimes it is in the form of an allonge to the note, which is a piece of paper annexed to the note, on which to write endorsements for which there is no room on the instrument itself. The accommodation endorser is a person or bank that endorses, which a person and bank are the same thing. A bank is a corporation. A corporation is a person. A person that endorses a loan to another party. The endorser becomes guarantor and is secondarily liable in case of default. So banks may endorse other banks' acceptance notes, which can then be traded on the secondary market. Endorsement with the phrase, without recourse or for deposit only, limits the liability of the endorser, the signer, in the event the instrument is dishonored. Now, 
And here is an example of endorsements. On the left, you have the grantor borrower endorsement. On the second, you have just the lender endorsement. And then you have the servicer endorsement. You have the lender in the center. And whomever the lender endorsed it over to, that second, that third endorser is on the third, the third image. <clears throat> so what's interesting to go further into the, the without recourse and limiting liability. So when an endorser endorses without recourse, they're especially declining to assume any responsibility for the payment. The endorser assumes no contractual liability by virtue of the endorsement itself and becomes a mere assigner of the title to the paper. Where a note and mortgage are transferred without recourse, legal effect of words without recourse constitutes endorser a mere assigner subject to no liability except as an implied guarantor that instruments are genuine, that he has good title to them, and that he's not aware of any illegality in them. Valuable instruments and the servicer. There is a holder of the note, mortgage, and other related instruments. The name of that entity is the custodian of records. Enter the mortgage servicing company. This entity has bought the servicing rights to the loan. The lender has sold the servicing rights to the loan to the mortgage servicing company, which is the entity who sends monthly statements to you, the grant or borrower, who collects payments and performs other custodial duties. In certain cases, servicing rights are retained by the original lender, even if the lender sells the loan. The mortgage servicing com company is an agent of the lender trustee and has servicing rights to the mortgage loan trust account. The servicer morphs between acting as servicer, withholding agent, and or custodian, each role being an extension of the trustee, the original trustee, the bank, the lender. The servicer is not the beneficial owner. Mortgage servicing rights refer to a contractual agreement where the right or rights to service an existing mortgage are sold by the original lender trustee to another party, agent of the trustee, who specializes in various functions of servicing mortgages. Both the lender trustee and servicer trustee are empowered by the grantor. They cannot act without having been empowered by the grantor. All powers of the trustee and the trustee agent originate from the grantor. Securitization. And we'll look at mortgage-backed securities to understand this. Securitization is the process through which an issuer creates a financial instrument by combining other financial assets and then marketing different tiers of the repackaged instruments to investors. And this process can encompass any type of financial asset, including what? Mortgages and notes. Mortgage-backed securities are a perfect example of securitization by combining mortgages into one large pool. The issuer can divide the large pool into smaller pieces based on each individual mortgage's inherent risk of default and then sell those smaller pieces to investors. One of the major methods of mortgage selling is the secondary mortgage market. In the secondary mortgage market, loans are combined and sold as one instrument to investors and banks around the industry. These collective loan instruments are known as CMOs or collateralized mortgage obligations, also known as mortgage-backed securities or mortgage-backed obligations. There is value 
in the original security instruments, value in the note and mortgage, and any other instruments arising therefrom. An example of such an instrument arising therefrom would be a pooling and service agreement, which arose out of the original instruments. And there is interest. There's beneficial interest to be claimed there as well. A pooling and servicing agreement is a contract that usually the borrower grantor is not aware of. The pooling and servicing agreement governs the relationship between the depositor, servicer, and or subservicer, custodian, withholding agent, trustee. Some of these entities, as I mentioned, morph into one another and fulfill more than one role at a time. And here is an example of a pooling and servicing agreement. You can pull them up on Securities and Exchange Commission website. But you see listed there is the depositor, the servicer, the servicer and custodian, servicer, responsible party, responsible party, trustee, custodian. The pooling and servicing agreement is the legal document that contains the responsibilities and rights of the servicers, the trustees, and the others over a pool of mortgage loans. This agreement can be a standalone document or it can be part of another paper, usually called the prospectus. If the securitization is public, these documents must be filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission and will be available at their site. It is the borrower's, grantor's, pledged property that backs these pooling and service agreements. So we have various actors involved, as we see. At the beginning of it all is the grantor. We have the grantor, which is the, the real, the creator of the mortgage trust account. You have the bank, which is the trustee. The bank is principal to the trust as the trustee. Then we have the servicer, trustee, custodial agent, withholding agent, which is really the one that matters once that happens because the mortgage servicer is the last endorser of the note. And so they become guarantor, except to the degree if they endorse without recourse, they're not responsible for payment in the event of default, but they're responsible to ensure that, that there's a good title to that property and responsible for uh, tax reporting and, and they had its other responsibilities as well. And then you have a beneficial owner, owner who largely goes undeclared. Most grantors don't know it's a, it's, an, it's a trust account, and so they don't even know to appoint a beneficial owner. We also have other parties like the, at a closing, let's say, um, you might have a mortgage broker involved who facilitated the acquiring of the loan, and you have a title company there who is going to be recording the mortgage at the county clerk. You have a bank attorney, usually somebody who's representing the bank. If there, if there's a mortgage, the bank is going to be sending um, out its closing agent to have its documents signed and whatnot. And then down the road, if the loan approaches default, you may have a debt collector involved. And... You may have an attorney involved. Sometimes the debt collector and the attorney are the same entity. Sometimes they're not. And it is at this point where the creditor-debtor relationship springs into being. Prior to default, it is lender-borrower, trustee-grantor. Right? Lender is trustee, borrower is the grantor. That's the relationship. But after default, the relationship turns from borrower-lender to debtor creditor but grantor trustee still remains the same that relationship doesn't go anywhere that relationship is foundational and then of course if if there's an attorney involved there's a court involved 
and they have a role to play in this whole situation as well. So if we look at a foreclosure related to a mortgage, note, valuable instrument, mortgage, mortgage and note, foreclosure is a legal process, judicial or non-judicial, in which a lender attempts to recover the balance of a loan from a borrower who has stopped making payments to the lender by forcing the sale of the asset used as collateral for the loan. There are several elements at play. There is trust law connected to foreclosure. There is tax law and withholding agent regulations connected to foreclosure. There's landlord tenant law connected to foreclosure and municipal law. The nature of the mortgage trust relationship is an irrevocable one, unless the trustee breaches trust by dishonoring the grantor or beneficiary. The grantor, being the truly all-powerful agent in this arrangement, the, po the power that the grantor has is the power to terminate the trustee upon some issue with the trust. That is a grantor power. And even though a mortgage trust account is an irrevocable trust, there is a way out, and that is if the trustee breaches trust. That is cause for the grantor to terminate the trustee. So let's look at the bank, the various actors involved. Let's have a look at the bank, the trustee. So the bank is principal to the trust. Bank is trustee. But the bank has assigned certain rights and powers to the mortgage servicing company. And these rights and powers, which it assigned, were received from the grantor. The relationship with the bank moves from bank to servicing company and to court if there's a court involved if it's foreclosure in a mortgage situation the trustee is the one who knows if something is taxed or not and because items of value are being exchanged within the federal jurisdiction of the united states reports have to be filed the obligation to make reports and to handle the accounting falls on the trustee Now, the second trustee, the trustee by extension of the bank, is the servicer, a.k.a. withholding agent, a.k.a. custodian. The servicing company is the agent of the bank, and by default, agent of the trust. The bank has assigned certain rights and powers to the servicing company. So the servicer is the one actually handing, handling the trust. The trustee, the bank, has tax liabilities, but the trustee bank assigns its liability to its agent, the mortgage servicing company, to pay the taxes. So the mortgage servicing company endorsed the note last and thus has the reporting responsibility because where there is taking of money, where the mortgage servicing company is collecting monthly mortgage payments, there is a reporting liability. The servicing company is reporting to the Internal Revenue Service. The mortgage file itself is held by the custodian. The custodian is a holder of all the records. The servicing company withholding agent custodian is liable for reporting of taxes and assessing to see if taxes are due. Any failure to do the job and the custodian becomes responsible for the tax themselves. How much tax is owed and by when depends on whether the party is foreign or domestic. The debt collector and all law firm. So at default, after default, debt, collection, debt collector may come on the scene and or a law firm. The law firm debt collector acts as a limb for the bank also and is also holding a certain capacity that allows it to do a complaint for the corporations. The attorney acts as an officer of the court. All attorneys 
in the United States it is well known that their first duty is to the court, not the client. Second duty to the client, first duty to the court. So the relationship moves from bank trustee to servicer trustee to court trustee. The clerk of the court. The clerk of the court is also a withholding agent custodian. A court case is also an account and trust. Administerial functions of a clerk include making entries, keeping records, delivering papers to parties, providing service at an arm's length position, having accountability to the entries and accounting they are providing. The docket is a ledger. A case is an account, a trust. The judge's cashier and judge's approval or denial is acceptance or refusal of an instrument. After the judge signs, his boss, the clerk, chief financial officer of the court, needs to endorse it. The clerk, just like the mortgage servicing company, just like the bank who transferred that liability to the mortgage servicing company, has fiscal responsibility, has tax obligations. The clerk of the court is also reporting to the IRS, as is the responsibility of any trustee. All roads do lead to accounting. So now let's circle back around to beneficial ownership. The grantor appoints and assigns responsibility to a beneficial owner, and now the beneficial owner has the interest. At assignment, the beneficial owner has interest in the account and the instruments. Beneficial ownership has to do with instruments and securities. Beneficial owner is the security interest entitlement holder, also equity interest holder. A beneficial owner of an account is the person or entity that owns the assets and the income received in the account. This is generally the person or entity that would be required to pay tax on the income, i.e. the person who is the owner of the income for tax purposes and who beneficially owns that income. The custodian trustee is liable for reporting of taxes and assesses to see if taxes are due. Any failure, as I said, to do the job and the custodian trustee becomes responsible for the tax themselves. As noted, how much tax is owed and by when depends on whether the party, the beneficial owner, is foreign or domestic. As a foreign beneficial owner, the trustee is supposed to withhold 30% at the source. Even if the beneficial interest is exercised by someone else, the ownership of the interest itself belongs to the beneficial owner. It can be the same person exercising the interest or not. And the beneficial owner is not necessarily the legal owner or the beneficiary. And is not necessarily the registered owner either. Sometimes you may do some investigating into who a beneficial owner might be and a name might come up. Then you come to know that that's the street name. The only, only in name are they the beneficial owner. There's actually an actual beneficial owner and that is just the registered owner. So a grantor of the account is almost always presumed to be the beneficial owner because most grantors do not appoint a beneficial owner. And for taxing purposes, the loan is viewed as income. And so the grantor is always the responsible party. All value associated with the account, i.e. the value of the instruments of the securities, goes to the beneficial owner once transferred by the grantor. Until assignment occurs, all value presumes to go to the grantor. And that does it for this brief lesson on beneficial ownership in the context of valuable instruments.
If you would like some private consulting regarding this topic and others, contact me, Siobhan, at privateconsultantscompact at gmail.com and stay tuned for more videos. Give this a like if you liked it and leave me any comments or questions you have and I will get back to you as soon as I can. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Until next time. Bye-bye.